Good evening, everybody. I'm Dinda Elliott. I'm the director of programs at China Institute. And uh, as many of you know, for almost 100 years, China Institute's been working to inform Americans about China and to promote people to people dialogue between US and China scholars, business people, artists, etc. Um, Presidents Biden and Xi Jinping may have cut the tension a bit last night in their virtual summit, but this is an extremely challenging time for US-China relations, and we believe our mission is more important than ever. We think that Americans need to know about China, to understand China, because there is no doubt our future will be affected by China's rise. There are so many questions these days, lots of concerns that China may be somehow turning the clock back on reforms, going back to a more socialist playbook and to a more authoritarian control. And so tonight we are so honored to have two of the smartest people I can think of to help us understand what is going on in China today as the country celebrates the 100th anniversary of the Communist Party. We have Yasheng Huang, who is a professor at MIT Sloan School of Management, where he founded and runs China Lab and India Lab. The former associate dean of, social, of, of the Sloan School, uh, Yasheng also holds honorary and special term professorships at several Chinese universities. He's published 11 books in Chinese and English, was named one of the most outstanding scholars conducting research on policy issues by the National Asia Research Program and received a Stanford University National Fellowship and a Social Science Research Council MacArthur Fellowship. Anthony Sage, who I'm gonna to call Tony tonight, is the director of the Ash Center for D Democratic Governance and Innovation and Daewoo Professor of International Affairs at the Harvard Kennedy School, where he teaches courses on comparative political institutions, democratic governance, and transitional economies with a focus on China. His books include Finding Allies and Making Revolution, The Early Years of the Chinese Communist Party, and governance and politics of China, and most recently, the inspiration for this evening's program, From Rebel to Ruler, 100 Years of the Chinese Communist Party. So welcome, uh, Tony and Yasheng. We are so honored to have you with us tonight. Um, let's just get right to it. Uh, at the recent plenum of the Communist Party's Central Committee, the leadership issued a, a historical resolution weaving Xi Jinping into the pantheon of China's historic founders, including Mao Zedong and Deng Xiaoping. People's Daily said that safeguarding Xi Jinping's quote unquote core position and the party's overall authority are quote, the fundamental guarantees for winning new victories in China's modernization drive. So through this plenum, what do you both think she and the party are trying to do. Um, who wants to jump in first? Should I go first, Yeshan? Sure. Yeah, that would be great, Tony. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, ostensibly the resolution and the communique appeared to be talking about the past, but really it was all about the future. And what we see from it really is that while there may have been, and while there still might be opposition to Xi Jinping, this really enshrines him as the person who is the right person to lead China into that future, mm -hmm. based on what I think is interesting, because previous resolutions on history uh, moved forward by criticizing and critiquing the past to say that first Mao Zedong and then subsequently Deng Xiaoping was the person to take it forward. This is different because Xi Jinping sketches a historical landscape which shows the inevitable outcome that he is the key leader to take China forward into the future. So what might that mean a little more concretely? One, you can bet your bottom dollar that he's gonna be appointed for a third term as general secretary next year, you know, uh, acts of nature notwithstanding. Secondly, it does talk about him really being the principal person in terms of Xi Jinping's thought which is often thought of as kind of an amalgam of the leadership group, but it's really made it very clear he is at the core of that. Mm -hmm. And then I think probably the substance we'll get into uh, shortly is it's essentially saying that the policies uh, that he's been developing with the other leaders over the last several years are those which he believes are gonna take China forward. So while I looked at the past, it's really about the future and what is gonna happen next. Mm. And forget about collective leadership is really all about Xi Jinping. Uh, 
Well, yes, collective leadership with Chinese characteristics, perhaps. <laughs> Yasheng, did you want to add something? Yeah, I, I, I think Tony got, got it exactly right. There's very little about the past. And in the previous similar exercises, um, the, 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 they were about the past, but they were also about the past mistakes. Right? Mm -hmm. So there's nothing in this document that um, that is different from the previous documents about the past mistakes. It mentions the Great Leap Forward. It mentions the Cultural Revolution very briefly, just one paragraph. The 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 focus is is not on on those periods of CCP history, mm -hmm. and so so I think it's forward looking. It's future oriented. Mm -hmm. And the other uh, function of the document is uh, to position uh, Xi Jinping for the third term. And so if you look back in the last nine years, he has done almost everything programmatically to get to the third term, right? So the anti-corruption campaign wiped out the political opponents cleaning up uh, pollution and, 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 and things like that to win the popular support. Um, COVID, you know, we can debate about the first uh, immediate response, uh, but there's no question that in terms of the mitigation, he has done a good job. And, and going forward, there is a question about how, how long they are going to keep this zero infection policy. It, it has all sorts of issues there um, and, 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 and you know going after some big tigers uh, uh, that, that's uh, and then revise the constitution so and now this historical document right? so it, it's it's almost like planned from the very beginning right very systematic very pragmatic uh, so I hope you're very surprised that <laughs> of all this work and then you decided to uh, step down <laughs> that, that, I, I just don't think how that that can that can happen? Um, it's an amazing sort of master strategy. It yeah, seems. I, yeah. You you have to kind of give that to him. I mean, yeah. to be to be honest, um, yeah. it, it's really it's 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 actually quite remarkable. I actually think it's mm -hmm. whether that's good for China. That's a separate question, but it has been very good for him. <laughs> Yeah, and and I want to get back to you know whether it's good for China or not. But so so can we talk a little bit about recent economic policy because that's obviously a subject. I'm sorry about the dog barking in the background. This is, this is the the joys of living with COVID. But um, lots has been written about the blockage of the Alibaba Group and finance the Alibaba and financial groups IPO, the banning of the DD ride sharing app shortly after its listing on the U.S. stock exchange and um, moves to appoint party officials in the leadership of top private companies and more. Um, so I'm wondering if you can both, and maybe I'll start with you, Yasheng, but characterize what you see happening. Is it a move to clean things up, you know, to improve the regulatory regime? And you could certainly make the argument that it was a mess, I guess, um, and, and an effort to modernize the financial system, or is it a move to rein in the private sector? How do you how do you read it and interpret it? You you can make a regulatory argue, argument and people have made that argument. People on Wall Street have made that argument. I, I don't buy it at all. Um, I mean, if you look at fintech sector, um, it has lower level of uh, problematic debt as compared with state owned banking system. It has enabled uh, entrepreneurs to uh, to sell their products and to produce their products. And uh, it is uh, supplying credits and uh, resources to uh, private sector companies that are otherwise uh, discriminated uh, against. Huh. And, and so it makes up for the shortcomings of the financial system. And I actually think that the bigger risk financial risk is with the state-owned banking system rather than with mostly private fintech uh, sector. Mm -hmm. the, other, the other thing is that if it is economic argument, then I can understand, you know, you go after one company, you go after one sector, but this is across the board, right? So this is finance, this is education, this is uh, 
sharing economy. This is real estate. I I I I can't think of an economic argument that would say it makes sense to go after all these sectors simultaneously. And 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 plus there are risks to the economy uh -huh. uh, that are pretty pretty substantial uh, as well. So I think it's kind of related to the first topic. It's it's really about politics and politics as a calendar, which is the next year, the 20th Party Congress. And you kind of need to clean up all these things before the uh, Party Congress. That That's my interpretation. And the other, just, just to finish that the line of argument. Um, okay, so I understand you go after uh, and financial, you don't allow the IPO, IPO to go forward on kind of regulatory uh argument why do you why do you close down the university by uh jack ma right so that clearly has nothing to do with the regulatory issues it, it's really about going after uh private uh, sector so so that's fascinating and speaks directly to a lot of the writing that you've done tony about the Communist Party's relationship with the private sector. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because, um, you know, it's, I, I mean, I would certainly say that I, and I guess a lot of us have gotten used to the idea that the Communist Party has basically been gotten comfortable with the idea of, you know, socialism with Chinese characteristics, which the rest of us would basically call so capitalism. Um, and now things are changing. So, so what is this, you know, is, do you see a continuity? historically here or what how do you read it yes and there's a continuity i mean yashang is right that it's also dictated by the, the political calendar what's been going on at the moment but i think um what is different from the past is that the leadership knows it cannot do without the non-state sector uh -huh. I mean, that's very clear i mean all the figures are there whatever it is 60 percent of gdp 90 percent of new urban jobs but where there's a continuity with the past is that the Communist Party, since its founding, has always been suspicious of the private sector or capitalists or the foreigners in the economy. And you've seen that uh, being manifest in different forms. When the party was formed in 1921, it was formed to abolish capitalism and to get the foreigners out of China. And of course, at other times, though, it's needed. Uh, that uh, use of capital to help it meet its own objectives. And so we see, you know, after 1949, of course, it relied very heavily on private enterprise uh, to help it recover from the devastation within the economy that had been wrought by the warfare, the civil war, and so forth. But again, the suspicion crept in, not like now, uh, which is much milder in that sense, but basically the policies then were pursued to tie up the private sector by uh, commanding the inputs into the sector and controlling the outputs and slowly squeezing it so it had no choice other than to give up uh, its position within the economy. And of course we see the, then the moving to the extremes at the, in the countryside, getting rid of private entrepreneurship and even you know little street sellers. Um, you know, I remember when I was a student in China, you know, towards the back end of the Cultural Revolution, we once saw someone selling little trinkets on the street and we all rushed to it. We thought this is so fascinating. You know, if I saw a trinket seller now in China, I run the opposite direction. I don't want them chasing me to sell their things. And so we see in the reform era, the same phenomenon. It needs uh, the non-state sector to get the economy moving to meet certain objectives. And as Yashang has written about in other work, it needed foreign direct investment. So it was always willing to bring that in. But the caveat has always been with two things. One, it has to meet uh, the objectives of the Chinese Communist Party itself, which can change over time. And two, it can never become sufficiently powerful that it might represent a challenge in one form or another. Mm -hmm. And so we see that gradual squeeze, you know, uh, reviving the party committees, having a party stake in the enterprise, having the party committee um, overseeing many of the decisions. 
And of course, when you've got companies like Ant Financial and some of the others holding tremendous amounts of information and perhaps more information than the state itself was holding, that becomes, I think, suspicious. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, Yashan was right to point out the education uh, area. And then I think there, there's the whole question of control over what is being taught in those environments. And we've seen again, a much uh, greater tightening uh, within that intellectual space and sphere that there is increasingly one correct story and one correct history to be told. So huh. um, it is different because as I said at the beginning, the party knows it needs both the private sector and foreign engagement, but it wants to make sure that it really controls those sectors to contribute directly to the party's key uh, objectives and priorities. Hmm. So I wanted to ask a little bit about how hard you all think it is to be a private entrepreneur these days. I mean, we know that there are, you know, pr these private companies, the Jack Ma's of the world and millions of others have gotten very, very rich. They've been able to, you know, they've been able to thrive and prosper, but but I wonder if you can provide some context about how hard it is and how, or how much harder it is for them than it would be for someone in the state sector. So um, Yasheng, you wrote a piece uh, in which you noted that, you know, the, the, in 2013, for example, 35% of bank credit to non-financial enterprises went to the state companies and 57% to private companies. And then a year later, it was 60% went to the state sector and only 34% to the private sector. And then by 2016, the distribution was even more skewed and 30, 83% of credit went to the state owned or state controlled companies and only 11% to private firms. So, you know, that sounds pretty dire. That sounds pretty tough for the private sector, but they found other ways to cope and whatever. So how hard is it to be a private entrepreneur? Well, other ways to cope are going to the informal finance, right? Yep. Going to the yep. informal market. Yeah. And so it's very interesting that, you know, there are two ways of looking at this, right? One is that um, informal finance is terrible and, and, and unregulated. Yeah. You know, you I can buy that point of view and then and say, OK, but why is it that so many of them have to resort to informal finance? It is because of fundamentally because of the design of the state owned system, state owned banking system. Uh -huh. So instead of reforming the state owned system, the government is going after the informal finance. And that's the problem that I have, right? So even if you acknowledge that there are risks, the right solution is actually to reform the state-owned banking system. So that's one. And the other is that the data that you cited happened very suddenly. Yeah. Um, and and so, so the, the, the private sector was always operating under constraints right uh, that that's not news and year in year out there were surveys that showed that private sector complained about not being able to get loans and but but on the other hand one one reason they couldn't get loans in on top of the state owned banking system inefficiency is also because they are growing very fast so relative to their kind of business needs they they need more money so that has always been the problem. But what we see before 2013 was gradual improvement in the treatment uh -huh. of the private sector, both by the state-owned uh, banking system, as well as the flexibility that you allowed for the informal finance, right? So basically, formal finance began to provide more credit, and the informal finance also also is is a supply and a credit. I I have to you know all of this coincided with 2013, and we know what happened in 2013. A new person came into power, mm -hmm. um, and and that's a very um, kind of what he has done is to reinforce the existing biases of the formal system, and then on top of that go after the informal finance, right? So I, mm -hmm. I, 
I, I think Tony is also right that it is kind of a love and hate relationship. Um, and he, he has also changed the policy several times. Um, I think if the GDP really goes down, they are going to readjust the policy. I, I, they, 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 GDP is, is not as important to the Xi government, Xi, Xi Jinping as before. But it is still quite important. So I, I don't see how they can continue with this policy. Mm -hmm. There are already signs that they're relaxing some of these, uh, these, these uh, restrictions a li little bit. Right, interesting. Uh, yeah, they're always, uh, I mean, you know, going back, it's like a concertina. I mean, they let, they let the thing out when, you know, if they're under pressure, if the growth rate is declining or, if there's a need, say, for example, with coal, you know, they spend all this time closing down <laughs> yeah. these illegal mines mm -hmm. and then they get a shortage. And so suddenly right. all these illegal mines or local run mines open up again and then they pull it back in. The one thing I'd add to what uh, Yashung was saying about finance is because the state owned sector gets, uh, you know, a lot of the loans on privileged terms, it often lends on to the non state sector. Ah. as well that's true. which is another way that you know they get money but of course they get it then at much higher rates uh, of interest um so you know the state-owned sectors they may not need the actual capital but it's a way for them to make money uh, off this uh, distorted system so um i want to just uh mention before we go on um to the audience just that we will take questions at the end so um please but it, but i need you to type them into the q a section and um please do that you know as you're listening type your questions in and hopefully we'll get to at least some of them at the end so um so let's talk for a moment more about education uh, the you know crackdown on education companies and then i want to get into the discussion of the sort of common prosperity thing but um so the education i mean you know they recently banned after school online education and tutoring companies as you as you mentioned arguing that what their argument was of course was that these companies were unfairly benefiting the wealthy and that xi jinping's policy is to try to make things more fair for everybody and um and all that so uh, you know firstly you know, I know, Tony, that you said that um, you think the motivation was about losing control of the message, that basically having no control of what these schools and tutoring and whatever are actually teaching. Uh, isn't, firstly, isn't it possible that actually there is some sort of, you know, ideology there, which is that about sort of fairness, or do you think that that's just kind of specious? No, I, I think it's, it's multiple factors. What I meant was that, you know, by shutting down a lot of these uh, private tutoring organizations, you would have great, the capacity to exert greater control over what is provided in the education. And there is a reasonable line of argument about the cost of all this, but, you know, the, the Gaokao, the entrance examination for the universities is still there. So any family that um, wants to get their child into those institutions is going to have to seek uh, education outside uh, of the normal schooling system. Well, they now can't do it through these big organizations. So you go to private tutoring. Mm -hmm. The wealthy is still favored in that process. What I've also seen happening in a couple of places, while I don't have evidence that this is a sort of conscious thought out thing, the local governments uh, have actually struck up uh, deals with some of these private tutoring companies and now they offer it through the local government. And um, again, you know, we see the reassertion of the state over a, a process and it's, you know, I, it is clearly a burden, it is clearly a cost, so I'm not denying that, and I'm not denying that there may have been some good honest intentions with it, but the, it's not really going to have the effect uh, that the leadership would claim in that realm. Uh, 
-hmm. And I think it takes us back to a broader point that is just a sort of immediate reflexive knee jerk reaction that if there is a space, the state needs to come in and fill it. Mm -hmm. Or if something else is filling that space, the party in the state needs to get its arms around it and make sure it's under control. And we that has just been a continual historical pattern. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, so Yashan, how is the investment community viewing all this? I mean, uh, you know, uh, this the crackdown on on the education companies, of course, overnight, you know, wiped out hundreds of millions of dollars of investment, and the the other, you know, recent economic moves, financial moves, have had, um, you know, repercussions for investors. We not long ago had a, a business conference. Um, and a number of the investors at our conference did, they argue that China is still sort of investable, investable, as long as you make sure your investments are in line with the Communist Party's, uh, you know, priorities. What do you think about that? I mean, it, you know, how is the investment community freaked out? What, what are you seeing? Well, the, it's a little bit harder sometimes to read what the investment community, how they evaluate things and um, I, I think they, um, you know, they, I mean, the, the simple fact is that China is the second largest GDP in the world, right? So at that, in terms of the fundamentals, you know, second largest GDP in the world probably would still grow at a healthy rate for some foreseeable future, right? I think the investors are looking at those things and then they factor in some of these kind of a regulatory political risks. So if you take the overall position to go in, then the next thing to do is to figure out which is the politically correct sector to, to go in, right? So at that, I, I think the, the critical thing is this larger picture, whether or not that continue to hold, right? Um, when you crack down on the private sector across the board, and when you wipe out the the wealth just like that, mm -hmm. um, you know, wealth accumulation, the, the real estate uh, is a very important part of the Chinese economy that is uh, slowing down. The real estate is also providing finance, uh, financial resources, not only to the households to the yep. wealth effect, but also to the local governments, right? Local governments need the money to build infrastructure. So all these are interconnected uh, with each other. So the critical thing is whether or not all these things are going to damage the broader growth prospects of, of China, mm -hmm. rather than these sort of specific sectoral, because uh, you, you can always say this is not the right sector, the other one is, is the right sector. The thing to remember is, you. I don't think we can get ahead of the Chinese Communist Party because they get to decide what is the politically correct sector. We, we don't get to decide and we can only guess what their uh, policy is and they don't really tell us, right? So <laughs> I mean, no, nobody, nobody would imagine going after the private education service sector going after Jack Ma in this way mm -hmm. and the sharing economy. Because usually we think about these as almost like, um, uh, almost like a crown jewel of Chinese business, right? Um, now we have to revise our, our view. So anything can go, right? So there's no, there's no limit. Usually before they went after, you know, humble entrepreneurs and, and, and people like that, they typically don't go after um, this kind of tech mm -hmm. oriented sectors. Uh, so I don't know where the bottom is going to be. Um, maybe the investors know better, I don't. <laughs> Interesting. I think there's a, you know, historical parallels again that I think you're getting to a position now in contemporary China. You know, the Chinese government needs capital and it needs access to global financial markets. I think it would prefer to have that operating with foreign capital rather than domestic private capital, because the foreign capital is not a political threat to the system and it's easily manageable. 
And if you look back to an earlier period of time, you know, a lot of the initial impetus of reform when China, lacked, when the Chinese state lacked capital and it had no private sector, it had a strategy of turning to Hong Kong millionaires mm -hmm. and making the billionaires. And he put them on people's political consultative conference so on and so forth. Yeah. And they would never be a threat. Yeah. And now we've seen that incredible growth of China's own mega private sector, which it wants to keep careful control over. But, you know, foreigners don't provide that same kind of a challenge. Yeah, I, I can I add to that point. I, I think Tony made a really important point. Um, there is a political difference between foreign capital uh, and domestic private capital huh. in terms of the politics that uh, that Tony described. Mm -hmm. right? In terms of foreign capital, if you don't like China, you don't go there, right? I don't think George Soros is, is, <laughs> is making any travel plan to go to China. You don't go there. So if you don't go there, you don't pose as a threat. By the very fact you go there, right, it already kind of means you buy in you know, some of this stuff. And you're not a, I mean, very often these people are, are uh, providing justifications for what's happening in China. They, they gave, usually it's those people who gave the regulatory perspective and technical interpretation of what, what's going on rather than political uh, explanation. But if you're a domestic capitalist, you have no choice. I mean, you're, you're stuck there. Um, so if the local government uh, doesn't treat you well, you kind of have to either put up with it, buy them off, or put up some resistance, right? So that constitutes opposition. Um, you know, and, you know, Ren Zhiqiang was arrested because he advocated free speech uh, I don't know a single foreign investor in China making the kind of advocacy that uh, Ren, Zhiqiang, Ren Zhiqiang did, right? So, so I, I, I think there's, there's that preference for more kind of, you know, more compliant uh, Hong Kong capital, more compliant Wall Street capital. Wow, that is, that is fascinating. Um, so, so let's talk about this. Uh, common prosperity thing that has become Xi Jinping's, you know, sort of guiding, um, you know, mantra. Um, you know, the fact is that they, he is dealing with, there is a problem, right? He's got pretty dramatic income disparities in China. Um, just to quote, Ch you know, China's Gini, Gini coefficient, which measures, measure, measures this gap in society is higher than that of the United States and among the highest of the, in the world. Um, you know, according to various studies. So, you know, the talk of this common prosperity stuff has been portrayed in the Western press as being anti-capitalist. Um, you know, and as I was saying earlier, we had all gotten pretty, you know, used to the idea that China had dropped ideology um, and kind of embraced capitalism. So, you know, is there a deep, deeper uh, sort of ideological mission driving Xi Jinping's moves um, or, you know, I mean, you could see, I could see parallels with what President Joe Biden is trying to do and pushing, you know, a social, uh, you know, social packages through Congress. I mean, you know, these are leaders who are facing real challenges and real, really serious issues in terms of income disparity. So, so how do you, how do you look at it, Tony, in terms of, um, you know, uh, ideological mission and the history of the party? Well, I'll let Yasheng speak to what actually has worked best in China in terms of ensuring that uh, that wealth gap didn't accelerate. That's uh, what Yasheng has written about, you know, previously uh, in the different models. So I'll, I'll leave that aside, but it is a really important point uh, for the leadership to think about that if this really is its commitment is what they are doing currently going to alleviate that. Mm -hmm. um, Yes, I think um, there is, uh, you know, it calls itself, you know, socialist. And uh, maybe that great inequality is one of the Chinese characteristics of socialism that they talk about. But I think, you know, if you look at what she has sort of identified, I think because of also public uh, dissatisfaction, three major policy areas, which are, 
creations of the strategy that the Communist Party has pursued for development. And those are corruption, which Yashan mentioned earlier, right. inequality and environmental degradation. Yeah. And they know those are issues which uh, do create public concern. And so common prosperity, as they talk about it, is, is his way to deal with that. But we don't know very much about what the policies are to date. Um, I think you might say it's driven by a kind of deeper socialist ethos. I think we should take Xi Jinping at his word when he believes that he's a Marxist and that uh, Marxist analysis is um, important for understanding you know, China's trajectory. And then it does become problematic. How do you define the reasons for that uh, enormous growing inequality within the framework of a party that says it caters for everybody um, and calls itself socialist? Mm -hmm. But there are, you know, it, it would need a fundamental restructuring of the tax system. Mm -hmm. It would need a fundamental restructuring of the financial system. China's never had a really redistributive financial system. Wealthy areas benefit more than poorer areas and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, and all those are significant problems. And, you know, the, there's one thing it could clearly do, uh, which is resisted often at the local level, and that is abolish this distinction based on household registration. Right. You know, if you really do represent the whole of the people, is it a correct policy to exclude a very large number of your people from um, similar chances of access to healthcare, education, and uh, job opportunities? Mm -hmm. um, and that has not yet been, I mean, it's withered away in many smaller towns, but of course, a lot of local governments don't want it because uh, they worry that they would bear the cost. So that is one clear area that could have been tackled. It's an institutional barrier uh, creating the inequality. And then there's this whole question of property tax, which China's played around with for 10 years now, and it's never really gone anywhere. We're now telling it's gonna be pushed more vigorously um, and to be a substitute for local governments because of now the problems around real estate to provide income to them. But previously it's always run into problems, you know, homeowners owners don't wanna pay it. They have no real way of set, they haven't really set up an entire system for how do you calculate real estate taxes. And last but not least, a lot of local government officials don't really wanna declare that perhaps they own more than one home if they have to pay property taxes on them. So, you know, it's a laudable slogan. I just don't see where the policies are at the very specific level or at the structural macro levels that Yashang has written about earlier that are gonna resolve this. Yashang, talk about that, the, the wealth gap, how they've dealt with it in the past. Yeah, I, I you know, I think, who can object to common prosperity? I, I think that's, you know. I'm all for it. <laughs> I'm, I'm all for it, I'm all for it, yeah. Um, <laughs> just among three of us. Uh, and <laughs> the, the, the question is really whether or not this is the right way to go about mm -hmm. doing it, right? Mm -hmm. Tony mentioned Huko system, the single biggest contributor to income inequality is the income inequality between rural China mm -hmm. and urban China. If you remove the, um, the restrictions on population movement, you know, it may not make rural urban income gap go completely away, but it would reduce that um, quite a bit. I, I don't see that in any of the policy announcements mm -hmm. connected to common uh, prosperity. And, and so, uh, and the other thing that can help the common prosperity is to reform the financial system, which favors the connected elites, mm -hmm. which favors the, 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 the big capitalists at the expense of uh, small entrepreneurs, right? Uh, another thing that you can uh, sort of achieve common uh, prosperity is to allow a degree of collective bargaining. 
and so the workers and and can bargain more effectively with uh with the capitalists right um and 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 also for the state to provide uh more universal health uh uh pension and and things like that right so now uh, the the income inequality is very high in china as you pointed out ding the uh, consumption in, inequality is also very high. Mm -hmm. uh, poor people don't want to spend money because they have to think about their own future and pension, old age, unemployment. There are a lot of other things you can do before you decide to go after Jack Ma, right? I mean, that's my point. Maybe after you have done all these things, you'll go after him. But I don't really see going after him as the first, as the most effective way of achieving common po uh, prosperity. There are lots of other things that that you can do. And I don't think it's going to be cured by getting these billionaires to do de devote uh, money uh, in philanthropic manners. Yeah, it's 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 not it's 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 really, and and when when the billionaires are. Denoting, uh, the, the, the donating their money. They're actually donating their company's money. Mm. So who are uh, funding that? It's actually investors <laughs> who buy their shares, right? And many investors are kind of common people, middle-class people. Um, so it's really, it's, it's really not, not the, not, let me just put, it's not the best way, right? There are other ways that you can go about doing this. So um, this just popped into my head, but the, you know, the, the recent hot book that everybody was talking about, R Red Roulette um, mm -hmm. by Desmond Shum was, it left me with, you know, which basically for those who haven't, don't know about it or haven't read it, it talks about, um, you know, sort of uh, deal making at the very top, very highest levels of the Chinese government. And in particular, it happens to be talking about deal making with um, the wife of Wen Jiabao, the former premier. But but the book and it's sort of, you know, salacious detail of how this all happened and it was all through connections. Um, the book left me with two uh, sort of feelings. One was that, you know, my God, this is, just the corruption is is just so you know it's beyond your wildest imagination but the second thing was it kind of left me with a feeling that um it wasn't it isn't possible or wasn't possible to do honest business in china that basically you know you had to be doing dirty deals to to, to make it and you know um some some you know chinese business people have have said to me recently that they were quite upset about that portrayal because they said it's really not true. You know, that there, there are Chinese business people who have been very successful who actually didn't have to play those dirty games all the time. And that it's, it, you know, there were ways to do business that were not corrupt. And so I'm, I'm curious as to how you guys, you know, firstly, whether Xi Jinping has rooted out that kind of corruption that had been so prevalent but secondly, whether there is any such thing as clean business in China. No, I, I, didn't, I, I, think, I think we don't have to say it's just one way, right? So right. you can say that I, I, you know, I trust what is described in the uh, red roulette. Mm -hmm. um, the detail is, is, you know, he's talking about his own business and, and the business that he ran with his wife. I have no position to doubt his his account. Clearly, he did all of that in China, and uh, Wen Jiabao's um, uh, family wealth that's well documented, right, um, by New York Times. And and mm -hmm. but you know, it's 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 also true that there are, you could you could succeed without that level of uh, of corruption and. Uh, just just Chinese economy is a huge economy, $14 trillion economy. Regional differences are big. Sectoral differences are very big. So, um, but, but, I, but I think that that's kind of 
beside the point. The, the point is that for any economy, when you have this wealth accumulation connected so closely with politics, mm. even mm. though it is, it is not everyday phenomenon, right? And it's not everybody's experience. I still think there's something wrong with it, right? So, mm. so I, I can completely see the point your friends made, mm. right? You know, they are clean, they, they create their business. You know, technology, I think in the technology sector, I think it's relatively clean. Um, manufacturing, right? Um, yeah. And so no question about it, right? But our usual criterion is not that corruption has to be um has to be everywhere it is it, it exists on a large scale and that's problematic and by the way if you want to achieve common prosperity um sort of getting rid of the power of the state to grant monopoly status to private capital is one way to advance common prosperity to promote competition uh, is one way to promote uh, is one way to achieve common prosperity. Yeah. Yeah, I think where you often see the problem is where it's related to land. Yeah, you that's know, right. it, it's yeah. both the access to the financing, but it's also because of the way local governments control land. And then that tends not always obviously but often will lend itself to kind of backroom dealing and so forth. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that Xi Jinping has been going after is really the families. And I think you did have a prior period where, you know, the families at the top of the tree, they controlled sort of different sectors of the economy, often because of what Yao Sheng is saying about, you know, the granting basically of monopoly control or monopoly dominance uh, within that particular sector. And I think you had a situation previously where much of the senior leadership had sort of, their families had carved out sort of different sectors uh, amongst themselves. Mm -hmm. So um, Yashang, I have to ask you before we, we have, I see one question and if anybody else has questions, please do type them into the Q&A section. Um, your new book, which is due out next year, is titled The Rise and Fall of the East, How Examination, Autocracy, Stability, and Technology Shape China in History and Today. So why are you studying and writing about, of all things, the examination system? Tell us what, what is the current Gaokao and what does, what does the examination system tell us about what's yeah. going on in China? So the exam system uh, in my book goes way beyond the college entrance exam. Okay. It goes to uh, the year 598 when China established the world's first civil service examination system. Right. So in my book, I looked at that event and my interpretation of Chinese politics and Chinese economy since then is that um, civil service examination, that how systematic it is and what kind of effect it has on uh, ideology uh, of the Chinese people, ideological space of, of, of the country, that has a huge impact affecting both politics and the economy. Uh, so that's the argument of the book. And, and we are seeing the, uh, still the effect today uh, in terms of this emphasis on ideological compliance, ideological homogeneity, and, and using the uh, promotion system, right, to, uh, to kind of control the country. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's, that's more from China's own history than from Marxism, Leninism, right? Um, ideology has changed, but the method is fundamentally Chinese. That, that's kind of the idea of the book. Mm -hmm. 
So there is a question um, from the audience, um, which I think I understand. Uh, so the question says, how capitalist is any country, mixed economies or the modern world? Isn't the question how of how how does this isn't the question how does the CCP manage the status, the state of um, the, the state SOEs as development tools for urban development, national power versus more market centric institutions to expand modernization, rural China and the shift of politics needed to maximize development. So I guess it's saying, you know, is, isn't it less about um, sort of ideology and more about how they manage um, the SOEs as can the SOEs be development tools? Yeah, I mean, yeah, every country is a mixed economy to greater or lesser extents. I mean, the idea that America doesn't have industrial policy is a fallacy. It just operates in a different way from what we would see in China. I think there are two things come together. It is, yes, clearly Xi Jinping sees it as the best development tool, but that development tool is heavily influenced by ideology which has always had a preference for the state and state engagement over the private and the non-state sector. So that might mean it leads to um, the kinds of systemic problems that Yasheng and I have been talking about that mean this is not perhaps the most effective development tool to meet those objectives. Now, the other set of arguments, so, oh, isn't this just another form of the developmental state along the lines of East Asia. Well, yes, again, and no, yes, you had the kind of privileged lending, you had close relationships between the big companies and the state, but they were big private companies. Mm -hmm. And one crucial difference, I think, is that in those countries elsewhere in East Asia, they would never have sufficient markets domestically to enable them to really sort of cause it themselves and close themselves off. And so to a large extent, there was the protectionism, but the protectionism was always based on the premise that ultimately they were gonna to have to compete globally. Whereas in China, the situation is with such a huge domestic market and with such support also as it goes international, it's operating on quite different principles. Um, and I do think the ideology there does play a role in that for the reasons we've talked about earlier. But I go back to the point I made is that I think from a lot of things we've been saying, this might not be the effect, most effective way to meet its development goals uh, in terms of urbanization or overcoming rural urban divides. Hmm. So I, I think, you know, I wanna ask you both a sort of bottom line question, which is, I mean, firstly, uh, you know, what do you, let's think about the future. What do you think China is going to look like in say 10 years? What, what do you think the Chinese economy is going to look like in 10 years? And ultimately this is kind of asking the question that you, you were, you know, posing earlier, Yashan, which is, is all of this good for China? Um, you know, will the current refocus on common prosperity taking precedence over market forces create new challenges for China's economic and technological rise? What do you see in the future? Yeah, so um, I think I worry more about politics than I do about the economy. Um, and we know one thing from Chinese history, and, and this is recent history. One thing that system doesn't do a good job at is transitioning power from one leader to mm -hmm. another, right? Under Mao, there were multiple failures. Uh, under Deng, there were failures as well. And the system got itself together in the 1990s. And, and in part, we, we really have to thank Deng Xiaoping. I mean, he, <laughs> he didn't help with Hu Yaobang and Zhao Ziyang, but, but he set up the age um, retirement, mm -hmm. the um, two-term uh, constitutional limit on presidency, and he also 
decentralize the power a little bit at the, at the top. Uh, by now, all of that is gone. So, 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 so the guardrails that he established that ensured smooth transition of power um, from Jiang Zemin to Hu, Hu Jintao and then from Hu Jintao to Xi Jinping, all of that is gone. Mm -hmm. it is, it's not there, right? Um, and, and we're basically going back to the Mao era now. Uh, where you sort of have kind of unstructured um, power transition. Um, so I worry about that um, more than I do about Evergrande and, and, and those things. Um, I think Chinese economic fundamentals are, are still quite good and it may not grow at 8% and 9%, and, and but at fourteen trillion dollar, at that size, if you grow at two percent, three percent, that's still a very, very respectable record, and, and it's probably going to uh, be able to grow more than that. The only kind of the economic thing that I worry about is um, is you have sort of real estate bubble being peers being being burst. At the same time, when the savings rate is declining, right, the Chinese model, the Chinese model of growth is extremely capital intensive. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so you, you, you kind of, you need a lot of capital to chase that growth. When the savings rate declines, you have less capital then you could you face the choice one choice is to slow down the economy and the other is to borrow from abroad right that's what south korea did that's what latin american countries did and you know what happened there right financial crisis and currency crisis and so so that's the kind of the economic picture that i worry about but i don't think that alone is sufficiently strong to derail China. But if it happens at the same time when you have problems at the transition, uh, at the succession, right? Succession, then 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 that can be that can be problematic. But just bef before you chime in, Tony, um, just to play devil's advocate for a second. You know, couldn't you? You're talking about an unstructured power transition, right? So, but couldn't you have essentially a benevolent emperor, you know, as China has aspired to have that, having that, you know, as its model? That's not fundamentally necessarily, you know, chaotic or a bad thing, or, you know, couldn't you, if, if you're not so worried about the economic situation, right? Well, so I'm not talking about the benevolence of the of the right. emperor, but emperor dies, right? So I mean that that's 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 the whether or not yeah. you're be, be that benevolent that that's right. something that you cannot avoid. Yeah, and and th yeah. there's actually data to show that authoritarian countries don't handle transition of power very well, right? Mm -hmm. And actually, there's a study that shows that some Latin American authoritarian regimes handle power transition well, but usually they have term limit. Right? Term limit turns yeah. out to be a critical stabilizing feature. And you know, I may be totally wrong, right? So maybe China will be stable without it, but I can't believe that it will be as stable as it was in the last three episodes of power transition right. without the term limit. Yeah, so you're talking about the threat of instability and, and chaos, which everybody is so afraid of. Yeah, yeah. Um, Tony, what are your thoughts? No, I mean, historically, China's only had one successful power transition, I would say. All the others have been either people being purged or purges happening in and around them, including, you know, Xi Jinping's ascent to power, which uh, course came after the whole issue around uh, Bo Xilai. So yes, I mean, I agree with Yasheng that um, this question of the um, political system is a significant one. On the economy, um, 
yeah, the fundamentals are good. It, it's it's a big economy. There's a lot of people. You can make an awful lot of mistakes, and you can still keep growth going along. And foreign investors are right. Yeah, there's a lot of money to be made in China as long as you meet the kind of priorities that they're talking about. But I think there's a couple of things. Um, the debt is an issue, but of course, it's not like uh, Lehman Brothers in the sense that a lot of that debt is domestic. It's not so internationally mm -hmm. exposed. But I think where there are a couple of issues are, um, we know total factor productivity is much lower in the state-owned sector than the non-state sector. We know the rate of return uh, has been declining. So you have to invest more and more money to get less out. Yeah. Which means that if China does keep pursuing this model, it's basically saying, okay, we accept a much lower rate of growth. And as Yashin said, yeah, a couple of percent growth, that, that's still a lot in a big, big economy. But it's the 2% growth, not at the point where America is a 2% growth in already a mature, uh, relatively affluent economy. But then we come back to somewhere where we started, that the party is nothing ultimately if it's not very pragmatic. And if at that point it needs the private sector, it will call up the private sector to come and bail it out again until it feels it doesn't need that sector again. Again, the pattern that you've written about in your book. Yeah, fascinating. Um, so let's take, there's, we're just a tiny bit over time, but let's take one last question, um, which is, is there any potential challenge to Xi Jinping and what role will Hong Kong and Taiwan play in China's economic political stability? Oh boy, that's a big one. Yeah, that's a lot. Um, <laughs> there is no, there, there is plenty of grumblings about Xi Jinping. There's plenty of rumors about opposition to Xi Jinping, but I would just say two things on that. One, there's no real clear evidence as the communique in this last meeting showed that there is another individual for that opposition to rally around. Um, a second point on that is, would, it, would things be any different if it wasn't Xi Jinping? Mm -hmm. And my sense is there, yes, maybe more softer authoritarianism rather than harder authoritarianism. But the problems that Xi Jinping and the leadership have identified that need to be dealt with and the fears and threats and challenges that they see wouldn't go away if Xi Jinping went away. And so I would think that any other leader would carry on in a pretty similar kind of path, um, you know, within the structures of the party as it exists. Um, yeah, I mean, well, <laughs> Taiwan, I mean, you know, any military action against Taiwan is the end of the Chinese Communist Party as well as the end of Taiwan. I mean, I don't think Xi Jinping is stupid. And so, I mean, I think he's quite aware that uh, precipitate action would be extremely detrimental to mainland China as well, which doesn't mean that you won't keep squeezing, pushing, and maybe you sort of explore something to do with one of the islands offshore. But uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it is a problem. It's the one area where you can see a series of accidents leading to an outcome that no one wants. Yeah, actually, I, I just pick up on the last point that Tony made. The thing I worry the most about geopolitics is, is accident. Mm, right. uh, South China Sea, you know, who knows uh, over the Taiwan Strait. Um, and because you have this kind of a posturing and then you want to play very close game, the accident can happen. Um, you may not want that outcome, but you may get it if if you play this game so close to the other side, right? So that's the thing that I worry the most. Um, and then there seems to be some sort of political imperative to have this ultra ultra nationalistic posturing, um, which you know is going to. Um, you can't just always just issue editorials on people say that you kind of have to send your planes out, send your ships out. Um, and, and that would be a that would be a disaster. That would be horrible. Mm -hmm. Maybe well, they could send paper mache ships made of 
People's Daily. <laughs> <laughs> well, they used to they used to uh, bomb uh, Jim Wen and Mazu with the oh, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, propaganda indeed. pamphlets. Both ways, yeah, yeah, it, indeed, indeed. Yeah. Um, well, I wish we could end on a more positive note, but I, I, you know, this is where we are, we're at. So I want to thank both of you so much. And um, another just thing quickly to mention is I know that another great concern for both of you is. Um, and all of us is the continuation of um, US-China academic exchange. And I know that Harvard just recently, Harvard's Fairbank Center just held, you know, a fascinating colloquium talk exploring sort of what to do about this conundrum of the challenges of, of academic exchange and how it can continue and what are the difficulties. And I and I just wanted to mention that I know that Yasheng, you're organizing something, you'll you'll have to tell it, but it's it's Asian American Scholar Forum. Uh, yeah. looking at managing academic collaborations with Chinese institutions at U.S. universities, which is another yeah, really interesting Yeah, thing. Th thank you, uh, Dinda. It's, it's, the organization is called Asian American Scholar Forum. You can search it on, on Google, and we have a webinar tomorrow at 8 p.m. Okay. We have uh, people from Harvard, from MIT, from Stanford, from Berkeley yeah. talk about kind of uh, uh, academic collaborations with China, how to manage and how to handle the complications. Right. We, of course, all hope that academic exchange continues. So uh, thank you both so, so much for joining us. Um, we're really honored to have your insights. And uh, to our audience, thank you for joining tonight. I want to mention that tomorrow night, you you know, you'll have your choice. You should go to the Academic Exchange Forum. Uh, we also have a screening at China Institute of the film Shower, and we're going to have a talk back afterwards with uh, the director Zhang Yang and Peter Lor, well-known producer of films in China, and Richard Pena, who used to be the director of the um, film program at, at Lincoln Center. So um, lots of good stuff to come and all very, very important conversations. So thank you so much for joining. And um, Tony and Yasham, thank you. We hope to get you to our stage again sometime soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Bye-bye.